All right, let's uh, open in a quick word of prayer and we'll get into 1 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the insight that Paul has given us uh, into so many areas, uh, both in chapter 1 and now again tonight, chapter 2. We pray, Lord, that we uh, digest the material, we process it, and uh, we hold it up against scripture uh, to ensure that it's efficient. We ask you, Lord, now to give me the words that you would have uh, this group understand tonight. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, Charlize uh, Theron, who's an actress in Hollywood, attended the 2013 Oscars in a dress made by Christian Dior, costing in the neighborhood of about $100,000. The white peplum gown was paired with $4 million worth of Harry Winston jewelry. Ms. Theron was quoted as saying, when I walk onto that red carpet, and onto the main, into the main ballroom, I want every head to turn and look at me. Now, it doesn't go on to say, but I would bet Ms. Theron might have just come from attending a church service in Ephesus, <laughs> because the Apostle Paul has some really direct instruction on just how one should be attired when in the presence of the Lord, which he shares with us in tonight's lesson. Our scripture passage is 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I've divided it into three sections. The first, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7, pray for all people. Secondly, 1 Timothy 2 through 8, how to pray. And then thirdly, 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15, women and worship. So if we start off in praying for all people, it's interesting that Paul starts his instruction to Timothy on how to restore order in the church at Ephesus with the topic of prayer. And if you remember back in chapter one that we started last week, you think of all of the problems that were in that church. There was worldliness, there was pride, there was intellectualism, and there was a general discontent with the will of God. So why would he prioritize prayer as his first issue with the church that he wanted Timothy to correct? Well, think about it. In chapter one, we saw that there were a number of Jews that were in the church at Ephesus, and they were claiming that only law-keeping Jews or proselytes would be accepted by God. Salvation wasn't for everyone, but only for those who came within the framework of maintaining the Jewish law. We also had in that church Gnosticism, and that was basically Gentile exclusivism, right? You had them saying salvation only belongs to the elite, initiated exclusive people who have reached a level of knowledge. And these are the people who have tuned into the various mediators and sub-gods and angelic beings that line up between man and God. So that was the false doctrine that, that uh, Paul was talking about that was going on in chapter one. So because of this, there was a severe error in doctrine of salvation that Paul had preached when he started the church. So this topic becomes a priority for Timothy to fix. So if you're going to start and you want a foundation, let's start with the right doctrine. Let's get rid of that Judaism. Let's get rid of the Gnosticism. And let's go back to the scriptures that I taught you when I was there. Stop this nonsense and realize that God wants all men to be saved, not just specific, not just the elite, but all men, not people that are having a works-oriented life, everyone he wants saved. And since God wants all men to be saved in the Ephesian church included, they need to adopt that idea and pray for all to be saved since the gospel is universal in its scope. That's why he's starting with prayer as his first topic in this chapter. And if you look at it, chapter one of 1 Timothy basically outlined all of the issues that were going on in the church and the chaos that was taking place there. And then chapters two through six are going to delve into each of those issues specifically and talk about how they need to be corrected. So why is this important? Because Paul understood, being a Jew, the folly of his people. Basically, the Jewish people thought they were the elite, they were the special people of God, and the Gentiles were to be despised. They didn't understand God's plan was that they were the chosen people, and he was going to use them as the conduit to reach the Gentiles. And they rebelled, and we know what happened. God set the, the nation of Israel aside and basically went directly to the church to be his conduit to, to minister to the Gentiles. 
So Paul is fully aware of the dangers of this false teaching that are taking place in this ch church at Ephesus. So Paul doesn't come with a command as he starts this chapter, but with a hope and an urging for compliance. In other words, I want you to pray. I want you to follow my guidance and direction about praying for the unsaved. And I want you to pray for everybody, right? But first of all, the primary purpose of the church is to reach the lost, not the select lost, the entire lost, Jew, Gentile, anybody. And that's true today as well, right? We are supposed to be praying for everybody, whether they're Hindu, whether they're Muslim, whether they're anything, God wants all people to be saved. And that's what Paul is emphasizing as he starts this off. The objective then is to understand the whole scope, the scope of the church, whether it be at Ephesus, whether it be in Galatia, whether it be in, in, in um, um, Corinth, he wanted the church to be a praying church. And he, he gives them four areas that he says, when you pray, I want you to pray like this. So now he's saying, let's start on the macro level. Everyone, I want you to pray for. And I want you to pray this way. He says, I want you to pray with supplication. That's a general sense of need. Being without something that is desperately needed. And so you get the supply you lack. You go there, right? Those without Christ need Christ. That's the need. That's the supplication that they're praying for. And if we're to come to understand the nature of praying as a church here at Ephesus, you have to begin by realizing there's a great need for the lost in the world. Think of the monumental shift that is and the teaching that was going on there that was false, that suddenly the scales are pulled away and people suddenly understand, wow, there's a lot more here that we need to be doing that we've been taught because of the false teaching. The second thing he says is when you offer your prayers. Now, it's interesting. Prayer, the word is used in scripture only in reference to God. It's a sacred kind of word. It's not that you're just going to anybody who can meet this need. You're going to God, and it's his great glory that will bring the lost to salvation. And in that process, he'll be exalted. So he links the two words together, the need, but then the source is God, right? And he says, now, I want you to pray intercessory. Well, okay, what does that mean? Well, let's look at that word. It says, pray on behalf of somebody else. Okay, well, you can do that. You can have a list of people that you pray for, but there's a deeper meaning to it. There's an emotional connection. He says you to do it with a familiarity. You, you have a feeling of sympathy with their situation and with great compassion. So now link the three words together. You have the unsaved people that you are now basically saying they have a need and you're going to God with that need, but you're going with a need that you're, it's a wrenching, it's a gut-wrenching type of feel that you understand that if he doesn't save them, they're going to spend eternity in hell. That's the way you're doing it. Not just praying for your family who you know, it's saying you're praying for everyone and you're doing it with a sense that you're emotionally connected with. And then the final thing he says, I want you to pray with thanksgiving. He thanks God that the gospel is available to all. There are no barriers. Anybody can come, right? And regardless of what God does, I give thanks to God. And this is the evangelical praying for all men, right? God may choose not to save people. We know that throughout history. Others, you know, people will go to their death not believing in him. And it doesn't mean he doesn't want them to come. It just means they've chosen not to come. But that's not our job to sit there and say, well, God, you should have saved this one or should have saved that one. No, our, our job is to give thanksgiving in all that happens, whether it's good or bad. And it says, in, you know, the point here is that if Christ gave himself a ransom for all men, then God wants all men to be saved and we should pray accordingly. No exclusivity, no selection process, all men that we should be praying for. I asked the question in our small group, did you wake up this morning and pray for Putin, right? All men, it says, whether they're evil or whether they're good, he wants us to pray for their salvation. That puts a responsibility on us. He says, pray for kings and all who are in high positions because the tendency of the church was not to pray for these individuals. Think about it. Who was the emperor that was controlling the, the, the town of Ephesus? It was Nero. Nero was the one that used Christians to light up his torches in his backyard to light his garden parties, right? But here Paul is saying, I want you to pray for him because he might you know, be led to salvation because of the prayers. 
And so how a church functions in any government is dependent on that government. So what he's saying is there's, there's a benefit here for you praying for the church, excuse me, a church praying for the leaders that are there, because you might have them come to salvation, and then that'll be a great thing, right? Think about it in the town of Fairfield, right? If we prayed for the mayor or the first select person that was here, and they came to Christ, they would probably manage or govern the town of Fairfield differently than they do as a non-believer. So that's a primary benefit that you hope for is their salvation. But he's saying there's a secondary benefit. You can live in peace, right? If, if, the, if the town, the, the government of Fairfield knows that our church is praying for them, they're going to look at us in a more favorable light. We're not rabble rousing. We're not questioning their authority. We're not sitting there boycotting the things that they're doing in the town. We're simply praying for them as a church. And he's saying if they're aware of that, it's going to be a more harmonious relationship between the government and the church. So there are good things that happen when you pray for people, whether it's their salvation or whether it's a matter of just the, the relationship that you have. He says, I want it to be peaceful, absence of inside disturbances. I don't want the church quarreling inside with itself, and I don't want it quarreling or having turbulence outside of the church. I want you to be praying for people and mind your own business, basically. The church isn't to be an agitator of society. It's not engulfing itself in those things that just disrupt the life that is being governed by whomever is in authority. He's saying the absence of strife and anxiety will benefit the church in a lot of different ways. All right, so now he's saying, I want lives marked by reverence towards God and for his glory. Peoples whose hearts are turned towards God, dignified in every way. So he's saying now, when you're praying, I want you to do it in the right way. I want you to have godliness, right? We have to have the right behavior, a commitment to morality. So what he's saying is you can't just come in and pray for people when you have dirty hands, as he, as he calls it, or when you have a sinful life. He's saying when you're praying, it should be pure. You should have repentance. You should look at the sin areas in your life and ask for forgiveness. And then you come and pray. Don't come harboring some sin that's there and quickly check off your list of things to do to pray. He wants you to do it with dignity. He wants you to do it in a way that says, I am pure, God, before you because I've confessed the sins that I'm aware of. And, and again, if it's rejected, right, if we're praying for people, if we're praying for our authorities that are in charge of us and they reject it, he's saying, I'd rather they reject the message than rejecting you as a church for being agitators and causing strife and problems for that leadership. So that's what he's basically kind of instructing this church to do. All right, let's go now and talk a little bit about what's the intention of the atoning work of Christ, right? It says that Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. And it's interesting, in a ransom situation, you normally think of kind of a, a kidnapping, where there's a demand that's given for an individual that then you write a check or you give cryptocurrency or some type of cash to free that person, and then that person is returned to you. But the word here is different. It's saying that the, the atoning work of Christ, right? God's plan is to save. Christ is the conduit in which he saves. It's, it's a ransom where he exchanges his life for your life of sin. So he gave his life on the cross one for one. There was no money exchanged. His life was what was exchanged for your freedom. And it's, it's basically saying this is what the divine commission is. This is why you pray for people. This is why you, you pray for salvation for everybody, because you want them to experience this saving grace that Christ has. And he's saying, I'm teaching you what is right, right? I want you to forget all of this other stuff that's going on. I teach Christ. I teach, you know, Christ crucified. I, I teach Christ resurrected. I teach Christ as being the only way to God. And, and he ransomed his, his life for ours. That's what I want you to do. So as you're praying for individuals, whether it be people that you know, people you don't know, whether it be government officials, that's what you're praying for, is that they come to the knowledge of understanding that their life has been ransomed by Christ's death on the cross. Now, as we shift, and, and he suddenly goes now in, in, into chapter 8, or excuse me, verse 8 in chapter 2, he says, now, how do you pray? Well, 
He's saying, in reality, if you agree with what we just talked about in this first seven verses, then I desire that men pray in every place, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Now, this is interesting, right? His desire, right, is what it says, but it's a command. The word, it's a military command. So he's demanding that when they pray, it's men lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Because what I just discussed, he said, praying for everybody, praying for your leaders, that's supposed to be done in every place, and it's done by men. And he said, when the church comes together, and it's time to pray for the lost, the men are to do the praying. Because what was happening in this church at Ephesus, you had women who were usurping the leadership roles of the church. He said, and it should be a habitual event of praying for people, but I want you to get in order. Remember, Chapter one told us what the problems were. Chapter two now begins to clean them up. And he's cleaning up the idea that there's only a couple ways that you can get to heaven and have salvation. No, he's saying that's wrong. And he's saying, I want everybody to have salvation, not just a select few. And when you're praying, now he's going further to give us more instruction about what needs to be done when you're praying. He said, it's going to be the man. I want men who are lifting up holy hands. Well, what does that mean? That's not a phrase that we use too often. Well, it's a symbol of the activities of life. His point is, whoever prays ought to be the kind of person who is living a holy life, pure living and a pure heart. Okay, very similar to what he's saying later in the communion table. If you have a quarrel with your brother, leave the elements and go and make amends with that brother, right? He's saying the same thing here. Don't come in and have someone lead the prayer for the unsaved people and who's got a sinful life or is living in sin. That's not the person I want praying. Further instruction to Timothy on what he needs to do to clean up this church at Ephesus. He says, do it without anger or quarreling. That's referring to the inner attitude of the person. Not anger means you're not dissenting against God or man. You're in harmony, right? You've got, you've, You've committed, you know, they've sins, but you've, you've, you've committed to be forgiven for those sins. It should be a pure heart and a loving heart. So first he tells us, okay, you're going to pray for everybody for salvation. Then he tells us who's going to do the praying. And then he's telling what does that heart need to look like as they're doing the praying. And now he gets to, you know, chapter 2, 9 through 15, which is women in worship. And, oh, my goodness, we're out of time. I guess we're not going to get be able to cover that tonight. <laughs> All right, just joking. <laughs> All right, so now he gets a little bit more specific here. Now he's talking about, okay, how do the women worship that are in the church? He said, I just told you in the first eight verses how I want men to respond. I want to pray for everybody, and I want men to do it, and I want to do it with a clean heart. And now Paul turns to the life and the heart of the women in the church. All right, and he starts in verse 9, and it starts off with the word, likewise. Whenever you see the word likewise, it's referring to what he's just talked about. So he's referring to verse 8. How are men and women to conduct themselves in the worship in the assembly of believers? How do men and women behave when they're in church? It's a command, not a suggestion. So he's saying, Timothy, I command that this is the way the order of the church rolls out. And he goes through three or four different areas of women. The first he starts off with is with their appearance. Women should adorn themselves in respectable attire. He goes on to say, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. A woman should prepare herself for worship. The dress is appropriate as well as to have the proper attitude. Okay, seems like a pretty straightforward command. So what was going on? He's saying, I want them adorned from the inside out. I want them to come with the proper respect for worship. And to ensure that Timothy understands what he's saying, he goes into further detail. And because these were certain things that were corrupting the worship of the church. And, and what was happening is that you had women that were coming into the church dressed out like Charlize Theon was doing at the Oscars. They were wearing very expensive clothes. They were braiding their hair, nothing wrong with braiding your hair, but interwoven in the hair were, was gold and was silver and were tortoise shell combs and other things that marked I'm wealthy and you're not. So what was happening is people were bragging about their wealth 
relative to those people that didn't have as much money. That was one thing. The second thing that was happening is that they were wearing provocative clothing. And you have to remember the context of where this is written. The Ephesus was one of the you know, most sinful cities that, that we read about in the Bible. The, the uh, Temple of Diana was there. There were prostitutes that were there that part of the service of worship and damage were to have sex with these temple prophets, uh, temple uh, prostitutes. And some of these women that were saved were now coming into the church at Ephesus with the same kind of mindset, the same kind of, of life that they had lived prior to that. So they were coming in in a seductive manner, and they were trying to be alluring to men, whether they were married or not, it didn't matter. So when you put the combination together where they were coming in and, and showing off their wealth, and they were coming in seductively trying to attract men, that's not what is supposed to be going on at church. And that's what Paul is saying. So we got to get that right, Timothy, right? I want men praying, and I want men praying with a godly heart. And now let's focus on what the women should be doing. So first of all, let's deal with their dress. And the second thing we want to do is let's deal with their heart, right? So if, if he's saying if they're coming in and the focus of the attention is to draw attention to themselves, that's violating the spirit of worship. Instead, what he's saying, a Christian woman should attract attention to her character, not her clothing, right? A, a humble heart committed to worshiping the living God. So Paul is telling women to search their heart as they approach worship. What's your goal? What's the objective that you're trying to carry out as you walk into this church? The second thing he's talking about is their attitude. He's basically saying you should come in with a humble attitude that basically said, I would be ashamed if in any way I would ever contribute to someone else's thought being an evil or lustful thought, or that I should ever distract anyone from the proper worship of God. He's basically saying, I want a woman coming in who is morally rejecting anything that would be considered dishonorable to God. So we've dealt with the, the provocative dress, we've dealt with the wealth and, and the you know, kind of bragging about it, and now we're dealing with what their attitude and their heart attitude should be. He also goes on and he says, I want their testimony to be pure. He said, I don't want a woman to come in who is faking it, just like I don't want a guy praying who's got sin in his life. I want someone to come in that professes and communicates loudly godliness in her actions, right? Her conduct should be pristine. It should support the claim that she is basically saying, I am a godly woman. And if the woman claims to love and revere God, then she can't turn around and say, well, I want to violate what God says and have rich adornment and leadership roles in the church. So Paul is, is, is narrowing it down. He's saying this is what a woman should do when she comes to church. This is how she should be involved. He then morphs in and starts talking about the woman's role. He's saying, let a woman learn, right? Let the woman be involved in the learning process of spiritual matters. Again, you have to go back to the context of, of the time, right? You had the Jewish people that were in that church. What did Jewish men think of women? They were second-class citizens. They wouldn't be included in any of the teaching that was going on, right? Uh, what were the Gnostics teaching? The Gnostics are saying, no, we, uh, women shouldn't even be in the same room with learning. Paul's saying, that's rubbish. I want that idea out of this church. I want women sitting right next to men as they're learning about the scriptures. And as they, they listen, I want them to be able to understand exactly what the scriptures say about what their life should be like, right? So let the woman learn is what he's saying. Controversial thing, but that's what he's commanding. And he, he's saying, however, there's a result of that learning that some women are trying to take leadership positions and we're teaching and taking authority over men. So he issues a command that women be given the right to learn, but it's essential that they don't usurp the role of men. So again, what was happening? Go back to chapter one and read it. In chapter one, it talks about there were men that were teaching that really weren't qualified. They were doing it for the wrong reasons. They wanted to be like the rabbis. Right. So what was happening as a woman was coming in saying, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I could teach a class. I could be in that position. So you had chaos beginning to develop because you had false teaching that was going on. You had weak teachers that were there. You had evil men that were rising to levels of leadership. And all of this was creating this vacuum where women were now asserting their rights as well. The other thing that was happening in Ephesus is as women became Christians, they were saying, well, wait, I have now freedom in Christ. 
I no longer have to be subordinate to my husband. I no longer have to be subordinate in church. I can teach. I can do all these things. And Paul is saying, no, that's wrong. So women had the privilege of learning and disseminating spiritual truth. However, the role in the church was different than a man's role. And even though there was a role differential, Paul is not saying there's a difference in their spiritual capacity or their need to know the word of God. See the difference? Paul is saying, I want women to learn. I want them to be just as fully educated. And in some cases, they're probably smarter than men. But I want them to learn with quiet and submissiveness while they're in church, right? She can't teach or exercise authority over a man. She is to remain quiet, okay? Now, by quiet, it doesn't mean that she was silent, right? If they were singing a hymn, she could sing the hymn. If there was a rhetorical question, she could answer the question. But when it came to teaching, Paul is saying, no, that's not the role of a woman in church. When the church comes together for worship, the women are to be silent. They're, they're to listen, but they're not to, to be able to be involved in that teaching. The women in both the Greek and Jewish cultures were held in very low esteem. The woman here became Christians, and again, they took on, oh, I'm equal as one in Christ. They began to take leadership roles without opposition from the church leaders. Do you see how the weakness in the male leadership in the Ephesian church allowed this to take place? When Paul came back and looked at the turmoil that was going on in this church, it must have broken his heart because you had all of these things that had infiltrated the church that he had spent three years of his life starting and being a pastor of, and now it had deviated so far off course that he has to now write to Timothy to say, these are the things that have to be corrected, right? And, and he's not saying, you know, I don't want women to teach. I just don't want them to teach in the church. They can teach in a Bible study. They can teach in a small group in their home. They can teach in a CBS class in Ephesus. But what they can't do is teach before a congregation in the church. That's what he's saying. I don't want the woman to take the role of teacher, to usurp the role of men in the church. She's not to be the teacher, and she's not to rebel against the role of submission, which God has designed for her in the life of the church. Think about it, right? Here we are at CBS, and Stephanie is, is preaching and doing a great job. And you may say, well, why doesn't Stephanie teach more? The reason is because if she did, I would lose my job because you would say, I want her teaching and not you, right? <laughs> but, but what is taking place here, this isn't church, right? And so Stephanie, with her deep knowledge of, of the scriptures, is imparting wisdom to men and to women. And Paul would say, that's great, that's fine, because that's not in the context of a church. I've told you before, I work at a board uh, at a Christian camp in upstate New York, and we have speakers that come in each week. We've had this discussion before. We had Tony Evans come in and he had his daughter who, who is, is a very accomplished author and speaker on, on religious things. And we allowed her to speak during the week, but on Sunday morning, that is constituted as church and only Tony Evans would speak. And his daughter spoke later in the week and did a great job. Camp, the camp I'm involved in is a parachurch organization. It is not church. And Paul would say, that's fine, but in, in a church service that he does not want women teaching. Okay, and, and it doesn't mean that it, in an appropriate place she can't pray, she can't worship, she can't sing, she can't offer praise, right? 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 is a cross-reference, and it talks about in the church she's not to preach or teach or speak in tongues because God has put that boundary in place. So Paul is just reemphasizing something to Timothy that he knows. Doesn't mean they can't speak. They can speak all they want, unless you're usurping the role of authority and leadership in the church. You're pushing yourself into a place of prominence. Why are you doing that, right? He, he again says, you know, in Corinthians 11, the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And he's saying that is the order that God has put in place. That is the boundary, right? And, and I can almost hear Paul saying, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what God has put in place, right? And he's saying the women should pray out loud. They should speak the word of God every time that she has the opportunity, but not when she gives the title of the official teacher or prayer on behalf of the church when it comes together for worship. 
So again, it's not telling women to be muzzled. It's not telling women not to learn. It's not telling women not to, to pray for people or to testify about their, their conversion, but to do it in the proper place in the proper manner. That's what he's saying here, right? And, and he goes back and he finishes up. And it, this is a controversial part of scripture, but it said, Adam was first formed, then Eve. Women's place was ordained in the order of creation. Man was made for God, and woman was made for man to be his helper. Well, what's he saying here, right? He's saying Adam wasn't the one that was deceived. It was Eve who was deceived and became the transgressor. And Paul's point here is the fall was kind of the result of the woman violating the divinely appointed role of the sexist. And Eve, in, she was acting independently of Adam. And his further point was subordination of women in the church wasn't invented by Paul. He didn't say, well, you know, this is what I believe and this is what I've come up with. He's saying it's rooted in the nature of the sexes and it's confirmed in the fall. Women need to be protected, nourished, and provided for by the man. That's the order that God put in creation, right? Not Paul. This is God's plan for, for men. Eve was deceived and Adam subjected himself to the deception. Both of them were wrong, right? Eve you know, it's basically he's saying man is not no less defective than women. They're just differently defective, right? So no daughter of Eve is what he's saying should follow the path of Eve and lead strategy, excuse me, lead to tragedy, lead to tragedy by entering into the forbidden territory of rulership, which was intended for man. Paul is speaking of order, right? He's trying to reestablish order in this church. And what was true then is true now. And again, we talked about this in our small group. So much of scripture today has been twisted so that women can accomplish roles in, in the church that, that fit their desire or their need. Not necessarily following what was outlined in the scriptures as saying this is what it should be. They twist the words. They twist something that, that says that a woman you know, should, should be um, uh, peaceful and, and godly. Right. And so a woman will twist that and say, well, I can be in a leadership position as long as I'm not dominant. Right. And now that's twisting scripture. Right. That's twisting scripture to allow a woman to go into a role that wasn't ordained for her by God. And, and that's what Paul is saying. Not here. This is what we're going to clean up. This is what we're going to change. So the last thing that he says is Eve stepped over the boundary. She's the transgressor. However, she'll be saved through childbearing. Well, what does that mean? What's he talking about there? Saved means delivered. What he's saying are women are delivered from the stigma of the fall through childbearing. Okay, how? Well, they're given the priority responsibility of raising godly offspring. God has given them the privilege of leading the race out of sin to godliness. So what he's saying is there is a role for women in teaching and praying, and guiding, and that's in the household with their children, okay? And, and the pain of childbearing was the punishment for the sin, but the result of bearing the child is the deliverance from that stigma. That's what he's saying here. Now, you have a lot of different interpretations from different commentators about what that means, but this seems to be the one that I think that the most people agree with. The pain is the reminder of childbirth. The result is the deliverance from the stigma makes a positive contribution to the godliness of the next generation, right? And if you think about it, that's so true. Think about your relationship with your mother if she were a believer, right? She nurtured, she developed, she was there, she taught you things, right? And, and all of those things kind of took root. And, and what Paul is saying is, I want women to learn because their greatest contribution is going to be to raising godly children. Not that the man is... It, is, is independent of that, but what it's saying is they're in day in and day out. Now, doesn't talk about women who are working, doesn't talk about women that don't have kids. That's not what is, he's going after in this particular chapter. What he is saying is the role is not to be leaders, not to be elders, not to be teachers in the church, but it is to learn and to take that learning and to use it, whether it be outside of the church in, in small groups or prayer groups or at CBS or wherever, but to use that learning to a good knowledge and to pass it on to your children as well. Men lead the worship, 
women provide the perfect balance by being the influence of raising up a godly generation. Now, you know, as we conclude tonight, it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, when I read some of this stuff, I thought, boy, Paul is being awfully harsh on women. And, and I think all of us kind of look at this passage through a filter of 2022. And, and I'm not sure that's, again, what we should be doing, because things have morphed so much that, that women's empowerment and women's belief that they are equal with men and women believing that they don't wanna be at home with their kids is not what, what Paul is saying is the natural order, specifically not the natural order in the church. One of the questions that came up in the small group today was, well, what about all of these churches that have women as elders and pastors? And I would simply say they need to go back and read 1 Timothy chapter two, because that is not the order that God has ordained for his church. As we conclude, I, I found this, this story. I thought it was interesting. Everybody's heard of Charles Spurgeon. He was a great British, British preacher in the mid-1800s. And he was the pastor of New Park Street Chapel. And he, he started preaching there when he was 19 years old. And he, he preached there for 38 years and preached over 3,600 messages. And he built an orphanage. He encouraged the church to be involved with helping the poor of London. He wrote an autobiography on himself. He wrote commentaries. He wrote books on prayer. He wrote devotionals, magazine articles, poetry, and hymns. I mean, consummate man, consummate Christian. But in his writings, he struggled with that he was being taken away from the home, trying to build up the church, trying to build up the community to be more Christ-like. And he felt that he was neglecting the religious training of his twin boys and so he made a conscious decision that he was going to preach less and that he was going to devote more time to helping you know, his kids understand the spiritual lesson. And he, and he talked about returning home one time and he looked around and the kids weren't playing like they normally were. And as he went up the stairs to the second floor, he heard his wife's voice and she was teaching and praying with their two sons. And at that point, he said, I can go on with my work because the children are well cared for and receiving the proper spiritual training and nurturing that God has commanded. I, I thought that story was so great. Now that's in the 1800s. We're in a different century, two different centuries. We have different attitudes, different beliefs of what a woman's role should be, not only in the church, but in society as well. And I'm not going to argue with people. I'm just going to say, this is what the scripture says right? And there's no embarrassment to say, this is what the scripture says, and this is what I'm telling you, right? And, and, and you interpret it how you will. But I think tonight, we learned about what God's plan was for women. And we certainly heard Paul tell Timothy, this is what I want you to do in this particular church. You can take that and digest it and reject it, or you can take it and kind of say, wow, I need to kind of put that through the filter of my life and see, am I in compliance? What is taking place in, sec in, in this book of First Timothy in the second chapter? So I'll leave that with you uh, as we break for tonight. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your words. We thank you, Lord, for the wisdom. We know your plan is perfect. We don't always understand, Lord, why you do the things that you do, but you understand it. And ours isn't to judge or decide if it's right or wrong. It's to comply. And Lord, we, we pray tonight that those that have heard the, these words will apply it to their lives in the proper perspective. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Merry Christmas. 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 Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy New Year. Yeah, so I can go home. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.